wildlife photographer and thanks so much for coming today. I hope you all learn a lot about photography. Um, my lectures are always very open, meaning if you have a question, if something doesn't make sense, raise your hand, get my attention, Steve, I don't understand, or, or just ask a question to clarify and to learn. It's all about you guys learning, okay? Uh, some of you in the class were at uh, a similar workshop last year and this uh, workshop has been completely redone because I really wanted to focus a lot on wildlife photography. And we start um, really being able to become good wildlife photographers by being good photographers. So we're going to start this process by understanding a little bit about the artistry of photography. Now an artist is someone that has the eye can look out at a scene and say, hey, that's something, that's really beautiful. It might be a landscape or something similar. So you have to have the eye, maybe a little bit of an appreciation for color or composition. All of those things go into being a good artist. A painter is an artist, and a painter is someone that uh, will use uh, different colors of paint as their medium. They'll have a canvas that they use to put their work on. They have brushes of different shapes and sizes to do their work. And a photographer is, a, is an artist. Some photographers are artists. And for the photographer, our film or our CCD and a digital camera, that's our canvas. And the light that is in the environment, that's our paint. And the camera, these are our brushes. This is our tool. This is what we use. And my experience in teaching photography for a number of years and going out into the world and, and seeing people with like really expensive gear, really great gear, and I talk to them and I find that they don't know too much about their, their camera. And, and, it's, and it's funny. Uh, so we're going to start today by understanding a little bit about our cameras and our agenda. It's good for me to look back every once in a while make sure you're seeing what I'm saying. Uh, we're going to understand the elements of photography. What makes up for a good, what are the things you need to know? What are the essential characteristics of a good uh, photographer? We're going to discuss tomorrow's field trip. We have to go over some specific information so we all know where to meet and what we're going to do, what our agenda is, and how we're all not going to take 32 different cars. We're going to caravan and carpool and we're going to arrange that during the first break about 50 minutes from now. Um, we're going to do a little uh, understanding of our gear and an Adobe <coughs> Photoshop demonstration. And lastly, we're going to end with a understanding of composition, an analysis of composition. <coughs> it doesn't sound really exciting, but that's really kind of fun <coughs> to do, is to look at different images and say, what makes that good? And what makes that not so good? What could be improved? And to understand those concepts. And then questions and answers again all the way through the lecture. Okay, I need a volunteer for a timekeeper, someone to help me keep track of my schedule here. Um, any volunteers? Someone with a watch, that, that is a criteria. <laughs> all you got to do is when it gets to be a certain You're time, retired. you say, Steve, <laughs> sir, uh, was it Bob? Bob. Okay, Bob, at uh, 3.45, please uh, just ring a bell. Remember, he's quitting at seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, creativity in photography equals control. If your camera is set to automatic, who has the control? Okay. Now, I'm sure there are brilliant technicians who put together your cameras, but I don't know 
if the camera, when it sees a scene, can evoke the artistry maybe that you see and appreciate. So you need to begin to take control and I'm not saying, I don't want to wean you and say you got to be off of auto all the time, but there are times when you need to come off of auto for artistic reasons. Your photography will evolve substantially once you begin to take control. Creative control equals understanding your camera and your gear. Uh, oh, let's uh, let's try to find the light so we can dim this up here. Let me see. That one. That one. All right. Now we're on track. Okay. Um, I taught, fortunate enough to teach a month-long class over in Europe uh, last year, and this is a shot at Trevi Fountain in Rome. And I show you this, not because it's a beautiful shot, because it's a snapshot, right? That's all that this is. My camera's on auto, and I took a picture, and what are some of the things that we would like to see regarding this that would make this a better image? Get rid of the people. Get rid of the people, that's one thing for sure. Closer, now, more detail, more contrast. More, more contrast, all those things, yes. The fountain. Yeah. The fountain is really our focus, is it not? Right, yeah. right. Trevi Fountain is really the focus. So I started to think, you have to think creatively, what can I do to turn this beautiful scene into something that's more depicting the art of that moment? So my solution, thank you, my solution was I came back at 3 a.m. in the morning, Unfortunately, I had come over on a flight two or three days before, so my alarm clock in my brain was still getting me up at 3 a.m. But I went out at 3 o'clock in the morning. There were there was two indigents and a couple young people um, sleeping on the steps, and that's all that was there. So I had the place to myself and the beautiful lights that lighted up in the evening, and it creates a more pleasant shot, a more artistic shot. Steve? Yeah. Can you move the cameras? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. That is the participation that I need. Otherwise, you'd be fuming by the end of the lecture. Here's another snapshot. This is in the Konos Crease. And uh, again, the camera tries to give us a proper exposure. Now, that's the composition that I want. But the exposure makes this a very lackluster scene. This is a shot, literally, and if you look at how high the sun is, here's a shot within moments of that shot. And isn't that a lot more pleasing? What I did here is I elected to silhouette the foreground so all the people that were in there that were kind of distracting, they're gone and it enhanced the colors of the sunset and I waited and was patient and a ship happened to be coming by right when I wanted it to be there and boom, you take that shot. There are several important elements in making a good shot. Let me get a couple examples. What's one of the things when you go out and you see something, wow, that's really neat. What's one of the things that you want to have either as a setting on your camera or something in your mind when you're taking that shot. Just give me some important ideas. The lighting. Say again? Lighting. The lighting is critically important. Morning, evening are typically very warm, very inviting times of the day. At noon is very harsh light and not so pleasing and very harsh shadows. What else? Depth what? of field. Depth of field. Okay. What thing in our camera controls the depth of field? The aperture. The aperture is a critical setting that we need to understand to control the depth of field of a shot. The depth of field is the area of your image that's in sharp focus. What else? What if we're doing wildlife photography and, um, and we can't see that, but uh, there's, a, there's an image in the back there of a couple eagles and the eagles is, one eagle is attacking the other. <coughs> Drama, you're having some impact in the shot, but what camera function in this example is shutter speed is what I was getting at, thank you. What else? A couple more? Composition, right, important. So I think he named most of them. Exposure, we didn't get actually. Aperture, shutter speed, 
Focus. Focus is so important, right? If you have a shot that's not in proper focus, throw it away, delete it. You're not going to be able to fix it. There are things you can do with your camera to help your focus be right on. Composition. Understanding your camera is the first step in the process of moving from taking snapshots to creating art. Cameras. Uh, there are a couple different types of cameras, and we have them represented in the class here. Here is a point-and-shoot camera, and a point-and-shoot camera has the advantage of being very compact and lightweight. I can literally just stick this in my pocket, and I often do. This is a 10 megapixel camera. I can take this out and get some really good shots with it. Um, as an aside, uh, in 1990 something, I bought my first digital point and shoot. It was a three megapixel camera, and it cost me $1,200. <laughs> you probably get the same thing for 199 today in a much higher pixel camera. The other type of camera is a uh, is an SLR camera. Yeah, this is a, a digital SLR. And an SLR means a single lens, lens reflex camera. And I'm going to explain what that means in a moment. And this is just a, a, a bigger lens that I put on here, but you have many lenses of many different sizes. And that's one of the huge advantages <laughs> of, a, of an SLR is you have lens selection. So you can customize the lens to suit the particular scene or objective that you're trying to accomplish. The path of light. Let me get my pointer. Okay, so here we see a point and shoot camera, and here's our object, and the light comes in through the lens hits our film medium. Now, all through this lecture, I'm going to use the term film because I don't like to use the term CCD, which is the digital equivalent. So it's the same thing. It's what records our light. So the light comes in through the lens and is recorded on the film. We look through a viewfinder and we see the image. So we're not seeing exactly what the camera sees through a point and shoot. An SLR camera is a little bit different configuration. <coughs> the light comes in through the lens in the same fashion, but there's a mirror right here. And the mirror reflects the image up into a prism, and that image comes out through the viewfinder, and we're actually seeing through the lens exactly what our camera sees. When we depress the shutter, the mirror flips up, and the light is allowed to hit our film medium, and exposes the image. Now all of photography is the process of getting light from outside into our camera. <coughs> what are the two camera functions that allow light to hit our film? This is not a hard question. Aperture and shutter. Okay. Now I'm going to dissect these two things because it is so important. It is so important for your understanding <coughs> of everything in photography. So aperture and shutter allow the light to enter into our film medium. Now the pupil in your eye is an aperture, right? It opens and closes to allow light in. How many of you have been in a room and it's been a really dark room and someone turns on the light? What happens? Your eyes hurt because your brain has been overexposed. Too much light came in because your pupil became very large in the dark, wanting to see the available light that was there. So the aperture in our eye, our pupil, expanded very large. Similarly, have you ever come from, come from outside in a very <coughs> bright environment into a dark room and all of a sudden you can't see? It might not even be terribly dark. And someone says, hey, come on over here. And what you might say is, can you wait just a minute? I need my eyes to adjust. And what 
is happening is the aperture in your eye is beginning to become smaller. It's adjusting to let less light in to your brain, which is that film medium of our camera. Uh, the aperture in your lens will open wide to allow a lot of light in and will close down to let less light in. Aperture. We have to learn some of these crazy terms in photography. Apertures are known as f-stops. And a <coughs> 22 is a large number, but you'll notice that the aperture opening here is very small. An f4 opening is a small number. 4 is a lot smaller than 22, but it's a larger aperture opening. So somehow in your own brain, try to keep track of that, that a small aperture number is a large aperture opening, and vice versa. Here are some examples of various apertures. F14 is a very large aperture opening, and going down to F32, which is a very, very small aperture opening. The aperture in our camera affects both the exposure and the depth of field of our image. The aperture settings are known as f-stops, and the depth of field is the area that's in sharp focus. Here's a picture of a rabbit, and my point of focus is right there on the rabbit's eye. There's the area that's in sharp focus. That was my depth of field, from his nose to the back of his ear. Look at the rest of this image. You see how fuzzy that is. Okay? So my depth of field in this shot was very shallow, very um, very small. The area is out of focus. Why? Because it's a large aperture. If I had used a small aperture, the entire rabbit would have been in focus had I wanted to do that. The aperture opening size determines the depth of field, and large and small we've covered. Okay, now, here's a shot of a bridge, and the aperture size, is it large or small? Well, it's really kind of hard to tell initially. You would think it's small, but it's not so small. It's an F3.5, which is a fairly large aperture opening, and it becomes clear in a second when we look at the second image. Now look at the detail in the foreground versus the detail in the foreground here, and that was shot with an aperture of F22, so we created a greater depth of field. Now, not noticeable at first, right? At first, you'd think that's the whole thing is almost in focus. But we, we can see by looking at this that uh, we have a greater depth of field there. Oh, I'm going to bypass our experiment. I was going to do an experiment of depth of field that we could kind of watch, but um, I think now we understand that concept, so I don't want to take too much time on that. We'll come back to it if we have more time. Okay, uh, this is an example of an image shot uh, where the aperture is an f3.5, so our depth of field is fairly small, and the, f the flowers over here are in focus, but our background is out of focus. Now I can change what I'm focusing on, which I did in the second image. Same aperture, f3.5, now the background is in focus, but my foreground flowers are out of focus. I haven't moved at all. Here's the next image. The only thing I changed was the aperture, a smaller aperture, larger number, F19, and now we have clarity from the foreground to the back of the image. Okay, we have discussed at nauseum apertures, and we needed to do that because you needed to understand that the apertures create our depth of field and they determine, they're one of the determining factors in creating a correct exposure. Let's go on to shutter speed now. The next important element in creating an exposure is shutter speed. Shutter speed uh, affects both the exposure and how motion in our image is portrayed. The shutter opens to allow light in. So, let me get my camera here. I'm trying to just demonstrate what I'm talking about. When I, I determine the, the aperture size I want to have in my lens, and 
and then I'm going to set my shutter speed similarly, and the combination of those two are going to create an exposure on my film. But I don't want to have that be something I don't think about. I want to look at the scene and say, do I want a large depth of field or do I want a shallow depth of field? I'm going to show you examples as we go forward that you want both. It depends on the circumstances. Um, and then there are similar situations where the shutter speed and determining if we want something that is crisp and sharp or if we want to see the effect of movement in our shot. Here are some examples of shutter speed. They range from on open wide all the time uh, to 500th of a second all the way up to 8,000th of a second. Anybody know what B stands for? Whoa. Whoa. Right, in the old days, you used to have a big old camera, big box camera, you'd squeeze a bulb, and that would open the shutter. Still keep that term. Motion is affected by shutter speed. Fast shutter speed freezes motion. Here's an image of a flock of uh, snow geese in Bosque del Apache, uh, New Mexico. And this is shot at 350th of a second. Not a super fast shutter speed, but fast enough to freeze the motion here so this is not a blurred image. If I did not know to do that, if my camera was on auto and this was taken at 125th of a second, which by and large is the shutter speed that your camera will often opt for in auto, this would have been a blurry mess. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. Here's another example, a shutter speed of 1,000th of a second. A stellar sea lion up in Kodiak, Alaska, getting ready to jump off a rock. I knew he was getting ready to do it, and so I was prepared with my shutter speed where I wanted it to be. Here's an Arctic tern also up in Kodiak, Alaska, and caught just at the right moment, very symmetrical, backlit subject, so the light is coming through the wings. Um, a pleasing shot to me, shot at 750th of a second, fast enough to freeze that motion. If I was taking a picture of me right now and my shutter speed was one second and I was walking, well, one second is from 1001. So I took almost two steps in that one second. And so if my shutter was open for that one second of time, you would have seen a blurred image moving across that screen. So 750th of a second is a very, very minute slice of a second. And so by capturing that image with that very fast shutter speed, freezes the motion even of a bird in flight. A slow shutter speed uh, can blur the motion. Okay, here's a similar image that I took at Bosque del Apache. And this was at a shutter speed of a 90th of a second. And look at the, the eye of the goose here is even elongated, showing the motion, the path that the goose was moving. But this is, this is kind of a blurry mess. I like the shot because it allows me to demonstrate that sometimes you need a faster shutter speed. Now here's an example when a slow shutter speed is an advantage. I looked at this scene, and of course, you've seen many similar to it where you have a waterfall, and to create this misty, satiny effect of the water, you use a slow shutter speed. Here I'm using 0.7 of a second, almost a second in duration, obviously on a tripod and that allows this, this nice misty effect to uh, be realized. Um, the amount of light controlled by the <coughs> aperture, or the aperture controls that amount and the duration is the shutter speed. The combination of those two that we've been discussing creates ultimately our exposure. Now, I start my lecture with giving you this dry stuff which is not the fa fascinating wildlife photography stuff you wanted to hear about. But we have to start at a point where our knowledge can progress and understand those more pleasing things. So now that combination of aperture and shutter create an exposure. The exposure is when the proper amount of light hits our film so that it's not too light or too dark. Here's an underexposed image. Notice that the foreground here is, is very dark, and so this is not enough light. Here's a overexposed image, 
And now look at our background. See how it's all washed out there? Our highlights are all gone. And there's our properly exposed image. And this is nice blue sky and detail in the mountains and our foreground looks nice. So it's real easy not to have the proper exposure when we rely completely on our camera's light meter to deliver the answer to us. Here's an example I tried to uh, work up. Tell me if this helps you or not. Um, it's kind of a physics question. So are there any physics majors in the room? That's good. Uh, I, when I gave this talk in uh, Europe, uh, there was a physics professor in there, and he says, Steve, that's not 100% accurate. I said, OK. Mm -hmm. okay. But I'm hoping it gets the point across to you. If we have a four-inch pipe, and the four-inch pipe fills that bucket in five seconds, we add a second piece of information. Two-inch pipe, smaller diameter, and it fills the bucket in <coughs> 10 seconds. I ask you the following question. If we had a one-inch pipe, how long would it take to fill that bucket? 20 seconds. 20 seconds, exactly right. So there are many combinations of opening sizes that will fill that bucket. If we went to a half an inch pipe, it would be 40 seconds. So the pipe diameter in our example is the aperture in a camera. The time is the shutter speed. And the bucket is a correct exposure. There are many combinations of shutter speed, different shutter speeds, different apertures that will create a correct exposure. Assume a shutter speed of 125th of a second and an aperture of f16 is a correct exposure. On the left, we have aperture or shutter speeds, I'm sorry. And a four thousandth of a second is very fast and a 60th of a second is very slow. As we go down the list here, a 60th of a second lets in more light because there's more time for the light to enter in. Bob? Yes, sir? Uh, your time is up. Thank you very much. OK. And uh, apertures, we let less, more light, less light in as the aperture becomes larger in size, larger in number and numeric size. And the larger, smaller the number, less light, obviously. The larger the aperture, more light comes in. Now, we assumed that 1 25th of a second, I'm just, this is a given now, 1 25th of a second at f16 is a correct exposure. If, <coughs> if, I wanted to change my shutter speed to 250th of a second, what would my aperture need to be to be a correct exposure? F11. F11? Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. Why? Who said F11? Tell me why, sir? Uh, you always, if you go 125. Hard to explain, but easy yeah. to understand. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, you move it down. You go exactly. You need more lighting, so you need to have the Exactly. Exactly. Let's everybody focus, no pun intended, on this. This is critically important. This is critically, critically important. If I have 125th of a second and we change to 250th of a second, are we letting in more or less light? Less light. This is faster a shorter duration, so we're letting in less light. So in order to counteract that to create a correct exposure, we need to let in more light over there. OK? So you are absolutely correct that the new correct answer at 125th or at 250 is indeed f11. If our artistic creativity said I want it to be 500th of a second, our answer would be f8. OK. We get the picture of how this works. All of these combinations create the correct exposure. <coughs> you, as the artist, determine, did I need large depth of field or shallow depth of field? Did I need blurred motion or sharp, crisp uh, collection of the, of the image? That's where your artistic creativity <coughs> comes in. Isn't it simple? I mean, there's not a lot. It's aperture and shutter. That's the beginning building blocks, understanding of being a good photographer.
see, do we have cheat sheets for this? Yeah. I, I don't have anything printed out. You will have to commit it to memory oh. and understand. Ah. <laughs> uh, I, I, will, I will try. Uh, th there's a club. You're all welcome. If you have the ability to come to the Carson Valley Photo Club, I will try to bring copies to the next meeting, and you're all invited to attend that. You can come three times and check it out, and if you elect to join, it's like $24 a year, so it's not huge. Okay, how do we determine what is a correct exposure? Now, here's an image. I, I shot this just a week or so ago. I like it. My wife really loves this shot. <clears throat> One of the tour bus drivers, Jim Woods, who's a phenomenal guy, I really love that guy, he, he just was going, wow, this is such a great shot, such great color in the, in the rough lake hawk here. And, and I was happy with it too, but my camera did not help me take this picture. It was not luck. It was being in the right place at the right time, setting up my camera information so that when this image presented itself, I was ready to go. So there was some skill, not tuning my own heart, but there was some skill and knowledge that was necessary <coughs> to make this happen. My camera, by the way, does not see this hawk at all. My camera only sees the light. It sees the reflected light. And light is measured by our light meter and the light meter attempts, I should have underlined that, it attempts to give you a proper exposure. The light meter averages all of the light in the scene, in, and this is the mathematical formula, it comes up with an exposure of 18% gray, which is like the color of the bark of a tree or a sidewalk or green leaves are 18% gray. So the average image, in fact, that we look at is 18% gray. What's this? What's the average of that image? 18% gray. Your, again, your light meter doesn't see black and white. It averages that, and it sees that. It sees gray. The light will range from pure white to pure black in any given scene, and your light meter tries to give you an accurate result. Here's an image shot uh, Friday morning, and it's not as apparent on the screen as it, as it is on my computer, but what I notice when I see this image is my snow, I know my snow is white, but this snow is not white. Okay, this snow is a little bit of a gray tinge to it. But this is the exposure that my light meter said was the correct exposure. Now this is too light on the screen, not, not light uh, in the same way on my computer. But now the, the snow is white. This should have more contrast, in my opinion. But now the snow is white. The point in showing you these two slides is when the predominant image in your scene is not an average of 18% gray, your light meter is going to be fooled. And it may not give you a proper exposure. If you were on a coal mine and you were taking a picture of a black cat, your light meter is not going to give you a correct exposure. It's going to think it's going to be wildly overexposed. <clears throat> what is the uh, proper exposure on a sunny day? Assume uh, F-16 and ISO 100. Anybody, anybody know what ISO is? Anybody not know what ISO is? Don't be bashful. Almost, almost everyone's hand should go up. <laughs> uh, ISO is your film's, the sensitivity of your film, okay, to light. This is equivalent to the old ASA on film in years in the past. And so if our film medium can be more or less sensitive to light, it can affect our shutter speed and our aperture. So it's another control that you can exercise in your photography. <coughs> now this is going to, the information you wanted me to copy, I'm going to say the same thing in that other slide in a different way. So. Open up your mind to this thought. Sunny 16 rule, this is an old photographic rule, okay? And <clears throat> this is a formula. The formula is shutter speed equals ISO at F16. Now, most of your cameras are set to an ISO of 100 by default. That's your ISO. 
And that's really good because the lower the ISO, the tighter the grain, the tighter the image is, and the clearer the image is if you want to enlarge it. So you want a low ISO, if at all possible. Okay, keeping in mind, shutter speed equal ISO at F16. So with that, we can calculate on a sunny day what a proper exposure is without looking at our light meter at all. I know in my mind what a proper exposure is. So let's give our example, ISO is 100. Now, shutter speed equal ISO. So here's our shutter speeds, right? What shutter speed is closest to 100? 125. Okay, so, uh, and the rest of the formula was shutter speed equals ISO at 125 and it's at F16. So we know on a sunny day that 125 at F16 is a proper exposure. If I wanted to have an F11 aperture, what would my shutter speed need to be? 250. 250, okay. All right, so we're saying the same thing in a couple different ways here. The point here is that numerous combinations of shutter speed and apertures will give us a correct exposure. But this is a good formula to use, especially if you're up on the slopes and you're taking a picture in a bright, snowy environment, you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem. If your, your camera will underexpose that shot, it'll look kind of gray typically. Uh, when you're using nice the, the scissor, whatever. Teleconverter. Yeah, teleconverter. That has to be manned. So you, yes. but your lens then is an automatic focus. Correct, that's why it's on manual focus. Yes, yeah. okay, and then, um, but on other shots, if you don't use that, <coughs> then you're using automatic focus. Yes. Right? I am using automatic focus 99% of the time when I can, because it's really good. Oh, it is, I yeah. know. It, there are, there are scenarios point? where I'll go to manual focus, but we don't need to talk about those today. Just know that autofocus is good. Yes, sir. What you mentioned before, you said you were going to get to it later, the disadvantage of image stabilization. Ah, thank you. We've got a, we've got a camera on a tripod right here. And on the, uh, <coughs> during the break, you can all come up here and look at this. Okay, I'm going to quickly adjust this so that you can all play with it. Now, this lens is on a sliding mechanism, okay? So as I slide this back, I want to find a neutral balance. That's pretty neutral right there. I lock this in place. And this beast of a lens, this is why I wanted you all to hand hold it. When I now play with this, look at this. I have complete, weightless, effortless control of this camera in any direction, up or down. So it's really phenomenal. Uh, I'll let you uh, play with it gently over the break, okay? <laughs> uh, oh, the question was image stabilization. Image stabilization is designed to be used when you're hand holding your camera. If I am, notice that uh, this lens here, this 100 to 400, you'll notice how I always flip <laughs> this thing around here. When this is on the bottom, I have a quick release. We're getting into the gear segment of my presentation a little bit, but that's okay. We have a quick release, and I do that, and I flick a lock lever, and my camera is locked into the tripod. I don't have to screw anything on. It's super, super quick and very secure. I can walk with this tripod over my back, and that camera's not coming off. Uh, and similarly, if I want to take this off, if I need to hand hold it, take it off the tripod, Click, boom, it's off, I'm ready to go. So that's a great thing, but I don't want to hand hold my camera with this thing on the bottom because it hurts. Mm -hmm. I loosen that ring, I flip this up, I lock it back in place, and now I've got a comfortable place to hold my camera. Let's talk about camera holding. If I see anybody doing this tomorrow, I'm going to smack you on the hand. Jeff, don't do this. Do you see how my left hand is up in the air? What kind of stability is this providing to my camera like this? Why don't you do this? Look at my left hand now. It has created a tripod effect. My elbows are into my body. This is very stable to handhold this image. Image blur is the bane of a photographer because it's a wasted image. 
Image stabilization, which was the essence of the question, it took me 10 minutes to answer it, is designed to be used when you're hand holding the camera. It will take away the normal camera movement you might have when you move that camera. Imagine, if you will, broad swimming, imagine, if you will, a rod coming out of this lens, extending to the back of the room. If I move this camera that much down, do you see how much I'm moving it down like that? Right in front of me, it's almost an imperceptible difference. But if you extend that rod out 40 feet, and I go like that, it's moving one or two feet, right? So the slightest camera movement will affect the clarity of your image. The image stabilizer should be set to on if you're hand holding your camera. If you have your image stabilizer set to on and your camera is in the tripod, it will be counterproductive and will give you a blurry image. Your image stabilizer will blur your image instead of making it clear, which is the opposite of what you want to accomplish. So it's only a bad thing if it's on a tripod. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, your image stabilizer has two modes. You'll, this is, there's so much that your gear can do and there's so little time to talk about it. But on the barrel of this lens, there's an image stabilizer mode one and two. Mode number one is for hand holding images normally. Mode number two is for panning. So you would select image stabilization number, mode number two if you're panning an image, an eagle in flight and you're hand holding that camera. So then what you won't do it on a tripod? If you're on a tripod, leave it off. So that would be like if you have the drive for the five or six pictures simultaneously, you would use the drive two so that it, I mean the um, right. stabilizer two so that it'll pan well. If you're hand holding the camera. Right, we're yeah. talking yeah. Okay, let's, I'm gonna breeze through the, all right, so here's the, to refresh our memory on the story, Eagles flying in, conflagration, skidding, sliding in the snow, giving them a dirty look. I'm getting out of here. See you, pal. And he's gone. Okay, so sequential images are really kind of fun. Great shots. I'm going to have to make some tough selections here, or I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, selecting an autofocus point. These are the autofocus points we were discussing. Here's an example. All those autofocus points in your camera. Center selection point is the most accurate. You can select one or all. This is a representation of it selecting the tree, the rock, the tree in the background, and the trees way in the far distance. Metering mode. Metering mode is how your camera determines the exposure of the image. There's evaluative or matrix meeting, metering, center weighted metering, or partial or spot metering. Yes. Here's an example of matrix metering. The camera is going to divide up the entire scene into grids. It's going to say, I'm going to average the light in the entire scene, and that's what most cameras are set to. Center weighted metering says that the theory when you select that is that your primary subject is somewhere <laughs> in the center. So you want your exposure to be relative to that. Center weighted metering would be selected. Spot metering is even more discriminating. I want to determine that I want that to be what I'm metering on to select to create a proper exposure. You would select spot metering uh, in that scenario. And would you be changing that with each photograph? No, absolutely not. I hardly ever change it. And what do you keep yours in? I keep mine on uh, center weighted metering or matrix metering, either one. I will change it to spot metering when it's a difficult lighting situation. And we're going to hopefully have time to go into a couple of those examples. This is a, um, a remote shutter, so I can put this on the camera, totally eliminate any shake. When I depress my shutter ever so gingerly, it's creating movement. No movement there, really nice. You, you can do a lot of really cool things with this thing as well. 
TV will Yeah, it does. Actually, the point I carry a battery charger with me and, and, and batteries. Uh, I got stuff to hook up to TVs. And, let's see what else is in there. I've got a little bubble thing that gives me perfect for the horizontal and vertical alignment of my camera. If I want to do something, a panorama shot, if I want to stitch multiple images together. Or the compact flashcards, what What's that for? Compact flashcards. Compact flashcards <coughs> is the storage medium in your camera. The thing that's in the camera. Um, What's your thought on that? Like, that you got one You get two You get as big as you can afford. Yeah. Really, I, yeah. Is what you do. Uh, I, I bought a two gig card a year ago. I can probably buy an 8 gig card for the same price now. <coughs> when I went to Egypt in, uh, in 2000, I paid $750 for a 256 megabyte card, and I bought three of them. Oh. Isn't that am amazing? Yeah. Wow. And now I can, I can get half a dozen images on one of them. It's just terrible. <laughs>
three or four years old and he doesn't have any training, a wild horse for instance, he's probably going to be sold for slaughter. And uh, so we do everything we can. Up in Story County, the Mustang still runs free. Soars above the pinion pines And we know these horses stand for something That is precious and more rare Than all the silver and the gold So we had an intervention here Tahoe Reno Industrial Lance Gilman Roger Norman Sr. Chair uh, Susan Austin uh, Stepped in and said We'll let you release these horses back out in the land here These bands of horses grew up and matured on the Virginia range. So they understand the dynamics of this range environment. They will probably find their niche within a few hours and they'll be really settled within a day or two. In a world where fences scar the earth from sun to rise. The horses that we released today I've picked up over the last few months. We've had them at our holding facility in Carson City. Uh, the state was running short on funds and uh, we needed something to do with the horses uh, on a very immediate basis and uh, the wild horse groups and the TRI Corporation and Let Em Run Foundation and LRTC, everyone got together and uh, this is a one-time release opportunity out here on the TRI. They, they have a soft spot for the horses and uh, they uh, allowed the state of Nevada to turn them loose out here. Uh, wild horses are part of Nevada's character. We can create situations where the wild horses can flourish and still be compatible with all the other uses and the growth in this state. And here's a real good example of how that can work. Teamwork between all the interested parties in the Department of Agriculture will produce solutions that are sustainable. Of course, nobody ever wants to see anything detrimental happen to the horses. Uh, they would much rather see them turned loose out here on the open like this and running free like they should be. The groups that have been participating in trying to help preserve the wild horses and to help look after the wild horses are the Virginia Range Wildlife Protection Association, LRTC, or at least Resistance Training Concepts, the Let Em Run Foundation, who's kind of the mothership for this whole thing. And we've also had participation from Lifesavers Wild Horse Rescue and Wild Horses in Need, which those two groups are based in California. Here in Nevada, we're running out of range where they can actually move around the hundreds of miles that they used to move around. So they need their own place. That's what Let Em Run is, has always been about. It's about finding a place somewhere here in Nevada that, uh, that we can uh, create a sanctuary for these horses. You know, I don't know where that sanctuary will be someday, but we're going to find a place for these horses because they need a place of their own. Shine soon the Kyle, reflected in that beast. 
Helicopter cleared the ridge line. We knew that horse was done. In the window sat a shooter with a tranquilizer gun. 100 yards from closing, but we missed one small detail. Sure, the helicopter had the speed, but the Mustang knew the trail. He was hell bent down the hillside where the canyon walls were steep. Racing for the shelter of a stand of aspen trees, and there was 30 feet between them when the shooter fired his dart. But the Mustang made the thicket and the needle missed its mark. And there was magic in the muscle and strength in every line. Face of Western history going back to Spanish times. Conquistadors and cowboys and legendary chiefs. Giant Sioux and Kyle reflected in that beast. Me and Wade speculated on the drama that had played while the silence rushed to fall back. Opinion and the sage, perhaps as long as there are Mustangs out there on a tree, the wild left in the wild west will become a memory. They sent this old song to relieve Singing la 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 It's a hand-me-down, hand-me-down Handed to me 